Welcome to the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. I'm your host, Kate Powell. In a world where humans who feel vibrant, whole, and fully alive seem to be increasingly rare, where burnout and brokenness seem to be increasingly the norm, both in individuals and our larger ecosystems, it seems worth exploring how did we get here? And more importantly, what perspectives or what cultural practices or what spiritual, ancestral, or animist wisdom processes might help us stay true to the spark and rhythm of our aliveness on this wild, heartbreaking, but ultimately rare and precious life. Thank you for being here. May these conversations help us to stay human in the face of dehumanizing forces. May they nourish our wild, tender hearts, and may they plant seeds which flourish into a more regenerative and vibrant future. Hey, Kate here with Wild Sacred Journey. So this is going to be a little bit of a um, continuation of some of my thoughts on purpose anxiety and um, what purpose actually is um, that I sort of started in the last episode. But I'm also recording this um, actually on uh, the day today marks one month since I've been back in Scotland. And, you know, it's been interesting being back. Um, Last year, I came for two months to Scotland, two months to Ireland, and it was an ancestral pilgrimage that had really been a couple years actually in the making. Like I'd started feeling the seeds, um, the little tugs, the, the beginnings of it about two years before I felt clear that it was actually time to, to go. And in the meantime, I'd been really consciously preparing for it. I'd been, you know, engaging with songs and stories and I'd started learning Irish, Gaelic, Irish, Gwelga, um, as a way of like, connecting with the language of some of my ancestors and, you know, having my mouth and face make the shapes, you know, um, there, there's something that activates within us that comes alive in us when our, when either we, our hands move and we make some sort of craft in a way that our ancestors would have made it or when we, um, yeah, move our mouth and our faces in ways, um, there's some connection, there's some energetic thread that weaves us into this sort of ancestral tapestry in a deeper way. When we uh, engage with that, the wind's really picking up here. So, yeah, so I'd really been engaging with it very intentionally for quite a while. And before I came over here and I'd really carved out a lot of space in my life. You know, I've talked about this in the terms of the seasons of aliveness, the rhythms of aliveness that we need, especially in the wake of burnout recovery, right? Is I'd really, um, yeah, I'd really, yeah, carved out some intentional space and then came over here and then was really with this intention of letting love move me, letting love move through me in some kind of way and seeing where it took me, um, seeing where spirit as, as I feel it and relate to it seemed like it wanted to move me and really listening in then to the places that I went and connecting with the land when I got here and then, you know, encountering different people as I met them and trusting that somehow, like looking at everything that was happening through this lens of, um, you know, this being part of a pilgrimage, right? So there was a deep meaning, you know, and not in like a mind fucking kind of way, right? Like not in like this overly obsessive meaning making kind of way of like, oh my God, what does it mean? Everything has so much meaning, but just being open to the possibility of there being some sort of magic, some sort of deeper force at work through me and through the people I encountered and the situations I encountered and the environments I found myself in and just really tracking what is happening then in me and around me because these encounters are happening, right? What magic, if we want to call it that, is now possible because of these things that are happening. So... 
yeah, so I, um, so I really engaged with it in that way and had a, just a really, um, profoundly, profoundly transformative four months. And it really, um, yeah. And then I got back and I, you know, I'm used to return shock and I got back to the States and, um, I really struggled. Um, it was a pretty rough nine months between when I got back and, and when I'm back, came back here again. And, you know, and I, I, to me, one of the things I was really tracking was how much of that was because I'd kind of, there's somewhere deep inside me, there's a definite distinction between regular life and pilgrimage, right? And I think those things are distinct things. I don't think we can, most of us can't truly live our everyday lives in pilgrimage. You know, pilgrimage, we can't carve everything away and always carve out this really sacred um, empty, spacious time for us to really explore. I think we'd do a lot better if we carved out more of that in small moments and in small ways, but we can't always set everything aside and, you know, have this, have this huge journey. And yet, you know, through engaging with a lot of learning more about storytelling and ancestral craft and skill, you know, and then this animism piece, right? Like if we really believe that everything in the world has a consciousness, then of course everything we're doing is a relationship, which suddenly has a lot more meaning, right? Like, you know, my boots, right? Like my, my hiking boots here are like good leather hiking boots. Periodically they need cleaning and oiling, right? Like I have a relationship with my boots. They're built to last. And if I take care of them, they will. If you have a cast iron pan, you know that those take a certain amount of care, you know, and they'll last you for forever. But, but there's a relationship you build with it. So there's something about like when, when we let ourselves, let the, the idea of everything, every moment, every encounter being a potential sacred relationship, when we let that bleed more into our everyday life, even as we're busy with all the mundane things, something, there's a possibility of something shifting. First off, I think we'd be a lot more minimalist, just kind of naturally, right? Because we actually only have finite capacity for relationship. There are only so many relationships we can actually deeply tend in, in the right kinds of ways at one time, you know? So we automatically come back into a more sustainable relationship with ourselves and the world around us um, if we start thinking of things, you know, as relationships rather than resources, right? We recognize our capacity, which if we if we recognize we have a finite capacity and we recognize that you know, all of life requires maintenance, <laughs> relational maintenance, then, um, you know, I think we're less likely to end up in burnout. And I think then if we can kind of give everything a little bit more, Im imbue everything with a little bit more meaning, a little bit more of a sense of magic and curiosity and openness and trust that there's a little bit more of a sacredness in all things, I think that affects how we feel about our purpose, you know, because I think then our purpose, again, I don't think we have to worry so much about our purpose because our purpose is just kind of happening. Yeah, because then we trust that we're where that we're where we are, you know, for a reason, right? You know, in the last episode, I talked about how purpose was, what if our purpose was actually an expression of relationship, right? What if our purpose is actually, is not a thing that we do or an accomplishment or some kind of like mark that we leave on the world other than a relational mark, you know? What if our purpose is, 
is to be whatever this divine spark that we each steward is, whatever this life force energy is, whatever this sense of some kind of greater energy that we each somehow, you know, we're each some unique filter for, what if our purpose is merely to express that, right? Express that through our wounds and the ways we've been hurt and the hurts that we've inherited so that they can be transmuted, so that they can maybe be repaired, right? Express that through our joys, our passions, our pleasures, right? Express that through also then this sense of allowing ourselves to be touched by the world because I think that's also some of what pilgrimage is like this allowing things to affect us and I you know we go through so much of our days with kind of these walls up and not really letting ourselves take stuff in and I think a lot of that's because we're very actually overstimulated oversaturated we're actually operating pretty much at capacity or beyond capacity almost all the time and so when that happens, it's like we're constantly pushing people and things away, even if they're the ones that we don't necessarily want to push away, you know? And so for me, some of what I found on pilgrimage by carving out that time was I, I was spacious enough and operating within my capacity enough that I could actually let the world touch me more. And then I got back to life and it was right back to kind of like filling filling with stuff and you know all the stuff in my house and my room and you know all the filling my days with all the things I was doing and right and um yeah just a very different thing and so it's interesting being back here and I'm kind of like again I'm very simplified down I'm living out of a suitcase <laughs> um you know and and yet I'm kind of hybriding a little bit more I'm I'm you know um making an effort to kind of not be quite as retreated, not quite as like in my solo journey, um, you know, to engage a little bit more with, with clients, with work, with, um, the podcast, you know, all of that kind of stuff with my creative, um, and sort of, um, professional expression, I guess I could say. And so, yeah, so I'm sitting with this, you know, I'm still very much in inquiry around this, but, you know, this sort of space of, like, looking at where and how I'm maybe drawing distinctions that don't need to be there between pilgrimage and mundane life, right? And seeing if I can bring those in a little bit more and, um, yeah. And so that's something that I do. I think I, I have this suspicion that, again, part of why we kind of are so obsessed with this idea of purpose, and I suspect our long ago ancestors probably weren't as obsessed with it, is that we're, we've disconnected most of our mundane life from uh, deeper, more meaningful, more relational um, perspectives and practices and approaches. <laughs> You know, and I also think too, like, um, I'd noticed this myself and sort of found myself saying these words. And then I think I heard, I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert. I heard say something about this one time too. And I was like, oh my God, she sees it too. But yeah, this idea that <clears throat> when we've discounted ourselves and the world so much, we actually have to kind of learn to hold things as precious a little bit more. But if we hold ourselves as too precious, if we kind of fall too into navel gazing, if we kind of fall too into like a sort of self-obsessed kind of way of dividing like our spiritual and self-inquiry and therapeutic practices from our everyday life, um, if, if we're kind of drawing that distinction and then you know, then what can happen is as we start to go into that, we actually start to get, it's like we disconnect from everyday life more and more and more because we feel really good when we're in our therapeutic places or our spiritual practices or our pilgrimages, right? Uh, and so we then kind of end up, we're still out of balance in that moment. We're leaning too much on the spiritual and we're disconnecting from the everyday life because we've drawn that distinction. And a lot of times I, I think some of where purpose anxiety comes in is because people are wanting to find some sort of 
validation of the version of themselves that they've found when they're in those, when they're in that yoga class on their yoga mat or when they've come out of that plant medicine ceremony or that breathwork retreat or whatever it is, right? And then we were like, oh, how do I bring this medicine forward to the world and how do I serve this and how do I become that or how, you know. Um, and we can almost become addicted to the spaces where we go to feel that way because we're somehow believing that we're finding more of our purpose in those places instead of our purpose being to take the version of ourselves that we find when we're a little bit more unguarded, when we're a little bit more heart-centered, when we're a little bit more in relationship with ourselves and the wider world around us, and to then bring that into our life, to bring that into that chop wood, carry water, right? There's that Zen, I think it's Zen Cohen, um, you know, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, you know? we're always going to have to chop wood, carry water. That's actually part of the maintenance, relational maintenance of being alive, of taking care of our bodies, of being in relationship with the world. And so, yeah, so I wonder too whether how much our purpose anxiety is, again, you know, we look at it, we look at this idea of purpose through this capitalist lens that we've all sort of internalized, particularly in the West. And then, of course, we have all these different promises, um, you know, come do this, come do that, come have this magical experience. And we want so badly for our purpose to have magic in it because we've disconnected our everyday lives from magic. And if our everyday lives had a little more magic, perhaps it wouldn't be, we wouldn't feel quite so much pressure and urgency to be doing things magical or to somehow find some magic within us that we then think we're supposed to do something with, you know? What if we let magic be a little bit more every day? And by magic, I just mean, I mean wonder, I mean curiosity, I mean serendipity, I mean that sort of surrendering to something, some sense that, you know, we're not the be all end all of the world and that there's some sort of bigger benevolent though capricious force at play, you know, and that we're just one tiny part of this giant web that is aliveness. And our purpose is just to be in that place on our web and express let aliveness express itself through us, you know, and aliveness itself is magic. We can't fucking explain that shit. <laughs> we try, you know, and so maybe science is your spiritual practice, right? But again, are we looking at it to get more, to try and squeeze it down into a box that looks like an answer? Or are we using, whether it's science, whether it's spirituality, whether it's, you know, whatever the method is, whether it's music, whether it's math, but, you know, whatever the thing is, the, the vehicle for being curious about the world and the beauty within it and how it works, whatever that vehicle is, we, you know, as like, I, for me, it feels like part of the distinction I find myself unconsciously drawing between pilgrimage and mundane life is that on pilgrimage I'm more open to wonder I'm more open I'm, I'm living more in that space of question so whatever my vehicle is for being curious about the world and the beauty within it I'm using that vehicle to ask questions rather than to put answers on things um, which if you think about putting an answer on something if that were a conversation with a friend and you were just constantly just making statements that had periods at the end of it that were answers that were like, okay, good, that's handled. Okay, good, that's handled. Okay, good, that's handled, you know? Then the relationship actually kind of has nowhere to go, you know? This is part of why I think a lot of times we can struggle when, um, you know, <laughs> I see this a lot with, uh, well, often more with my female clients who are often struggling with communication challenges with some with male partners a lot of times, you know, where they're wanting to be in curiosity around their big emotions and their partner wants to fix it. Or sometimes it's parents and kids, right? Or whatever. We can all fall into this stuff. So 
you know, that those are these based on how gender is socialized within our community, it tends to fall along these patterns, but it's not innate to any, any, we all have these, these patterns within us, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but yeah, like, like, you know, notice when fixing or answering or having something clear is actually maybe cutting off the relationship rather than tending the relationship. And sometimes relationships need to be a little bit more about questions and messiness and curiosity and open space because that's where then more of the growth and the evolution can actually start to happen. So that's a little bit of a tangent I feel like I went on, but um, yeah, but those are some of the thoughts I'm kind of sitting with and noticing kind of one month into being back here and and um, realizing how much I'm actually still even integrating my last trip. Like I started doing some integrating of last year's trip when I was back in the States, but I think I actually needed to come back here to continue integrating because I think some of these curiosities about how do we start to bring more meaning and more sacredness, like me becoming more conscious of doing that, you know, I kind of, um, I kind of, I think stumbled into something and I think this can happen a lot. I, this has happened to me in my yoga practice before, right? Where I had a pose I didn't think I could do and an asana and I found myself suddenly doing it one day when I tried and, uh, you know, I was so surprised. I didn't, I, cause I hadn't even had, my mind hadn't even been able to conceive of the possibility of me being able to do it. And then I tried again and I wouldn't be able to do it. And it would take me months, sometimes even years, to get back to a place where I could actually then do that pose regularly, consistently, and in ways that felt solid. Because it was like sometimes we stumble into something that we, because we need to know the possibilities there. And then we actually have to go back and build up the skill, build up the capacity to actually be able to steward that. And so I think it can be a little bit like that with our purpose sometimes, but I, I think, you know, life is just like that, whether we call it our, our purpose or not. And so I think for me, you know, whatever I stumbled into on last year's pilgrimage, even though I'd been consciously preparing for it, I think in a lot of ways, um, the preparation opened me to something that was so much bigger than I was yet really ready to carry. And so that's kind of where we start to bring integration into this integration. Then it's the process of actually becoming capable of carrying the things that we stumble into. You know, we can see that in relationships, right? We you fall in love and you think it's going to be all amazing and it's going to be easy. And then life happens and, you know, your relationship is put through a lot of tests that you weren't expecting, right? And then sometimes you realize it was the right relationship to do that growth work in. Sometimes it isn't. But either way, it's like yeah, we stumble into the things. We stumble into the vulnerability and the openness and the unprotectedness. We stumble into these sacred states of pilgrimage, of being curious and vulnerable and, yeah, and, and an expression of something bigger. And then we get that that stumbling into it, our capacity and our skill at stewarding that gets tested by life. And then we kind of have to keep orienting ourselves back to something um, deep and true and keep kind of bringing ourselves back. And so that's where I think, you know, a lot of these um, ancestral and animist practices, wisdom traditions and practices were the purpose of that was to help us humans kind of keep orienting towards some sort of sacred meaning um, in our everyday so that we could keep expressing purpose, um, keep expressing aliveness through us, um, without experiencing burnout, without experiencing a, a, yeah, this disconnect that then leaves us feeling kind of anxious and disoriented. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Um, and yeah, maybe, uh, I think, um, the guest who, um, 
had originally, or the, you know, the podcast listener who had originally written to me kind of asking about my thoughts about purpose, anxiety, and integration and stuff has agreed to um, record an episode with me um, where we'll kind of explore this idea of integration through her experience of like not having had it and then she'll get to kind of ask me some of her questions about it so I'm pretty excited about that so we don't have a date set yet to record that but um hopefully we'll get to that soon I have to kind of balance it with um where there are semi-quiet places to record (laughs) um so yeah so Hopefully, um, but hopefully that'll be soon so we can kind of keep some of this conversation going. So meantime, I mean, if this provokes any thoughts for you or, you know, sparks anything for you, I'd love to hear. And um, yeah, that'd be well. I'm going to take my, my cold hand that's been holding my phone while I record this. I'm going to take my cold hand and put it in my pocket because the temperature is definitely dropping here. I, think I need to put my, my windbreaker on as well. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, Yeah, I'll see you next time.